The Cage, written and narrated by Kieran Marsden. In the future, there'll be fines, community service, prison, and the cage. Charles Bennett, social scientist. The cage had made me wish I'd got the death sentence, so I could have gone to hell instead. Elia Darwin, murderer. April 2nd, 2051. Official report, Maximum Security Correction Center. The Maximum Security Correction Center is a large 10 glass prison facility. It is the only one of its kind in the world. It holds over a thousand male inmates. All are dangerous and demanding prisoners. All have committed the most severe crimes. The Correction Center faces an enormous and unique challenge. Prisoners experience is one of extreme violence and often a struggle to survive. No bedding, eating utensils or toiletries are provided. Virtually all prisoners are unsafe and levels of violence are unprecedented. These glass prisons are often overcrowded and most have never been cleaned. This has resulted in excessive filth and high levels of graffiti, even blood-stained floors. Prisoners' relationship with staff is virtually non-existent. It is to be noted that Facility 4 presents peculiarities. There appears to be a hierarchy not apparent in the other glass prisons. A prisoner pointed at us and appear to be protected by the other inmates. Further inspection is advised. One. My name's Dan Barrett. I'm a security guard at the cage. It's awful here. More awful than you could ever imagine. I stand beneath the shower head completely naked, in a cold blue room beside the changing room, waiting to reawake. Slowly I turn on the tap, and the broom fills with mist, and I reach down and pick up the plastic bottle that holds an illuminating blue shower gel. I squeeze the bottle and balance the thick liquid between my fingers, rubbing it into my back, admiring my triceps. They're really coming along. I squeeze out more gel and run my hand through the top of my head, where the hair is short. And from the changing room, I hear laughter. It means the morning workout is over and the boys have arrived. Any second now, the serenity will be broken. I look through the mist towards the opening in the wall and wonder who will enter first. It's Joshua. His hazel eyes glisten through the haze and a simple smile appears from his goatee. Oi, Barrett, when did you sneak in here? He says, walking through the mist, revealing his nakedness. He's a little tubby. You can see he enjoys a cold beer after work with a cheesy pizza. It's quite evident he isn't working as hard as some others in the gym. On his left arm is a sleeve tattoo, made up of koi carp and a fantastic display of blues and oranges. For a moment I think they could be alive. The mist is so thick they seem to be swimming through it. Some serious sweat out there today, he says, flicking the metal lever, embracing the warm water. What were you benching today? Did you hit 260? He says, drenching his face and shaking his head like a wet dog. I like Joshua Jacobs. We are very different people, but we click. He's the kind of guy with a troubled childhood, never knew his dad and constantly fighting with his mum, calling her a slut on the regular. I see a real hate when he speaks about her. Yeah, I was getting close actually, just shy. I think I'll be hitting it next week, I reckon. I say squeezing out more shower gel into my hands, rubbing my pecs that are already beginning to ache, a good ache. Then I hear more steps approach the shower room with a rumble of muffled talk. You're obviously the strongest now, right? Asks Joshua, beginning to work the shower gel into his hair, creating a white lava that runs down his face. I look towards the entrance of the changing room and the mist separates, parted by his presence alone. He stares at me and Joshua, and for a reason, I can't explain we feel obliged to keep quiet. He then takes a space between two spots, flicking two metal levers and embracing the water from both shower heads. I watch him face the wall. His back reminds me of a silverback gorilla. It's so thick, it looks like it could take a hammer to the spine and not flinch. He runs his hand through his short blonde hair, and the movement makes more muscle ripple. I see lumps under red skin where I've never seen them before. I'm not sure I'm the strongest anymore, I say. That guy, that guy doesn't count, whispers Joshua. He's on steroids. Look at his back, for Christ's sake. More spots than a Dalmatian. He's right. 
The guy's obviously a roidhead. When he entered, his face looked ready to pop, just like every spot upon his puss-ridden back. You think? I say, knowing it's true, but wanting Josh to enlarge my ego. Of course. The guy's ready to blow. Give his six months he's having a heart attack. I can assure you that. I then hear the chatter from the changing room. I know the voices immediately. It's Reynolds and Stamps. Second names, of course. They're the kind of guys that never leave each other's sides. They're more like brothers than friends, except they're opposite in appearance. They're like Laurel and Hardy, unwittingly providing us guards with comedy. First to enter is Reynolds. He's a short, fat lump of a man that always smells of B.O. He appears through the mist, waddling in. His belly moves more than his feet. He has short grey hair, always patchy with stubble on his multiple chins. He's a compulsive liar too, saying he's had every job under the sun, from doorman to dog catcher, he's done it all, so he says. I never fall for his nonsense, but I act interested as he tells me about the war he served in or the man's life he'd rescued on the weekend. It's his fake interest that makes him think we're friends, when really he just provides me with a little entertainment. Hey, Dan, says Reynolds with a cheeky grin. Looks like you got some competition out there, he says, walking through the mist with an annoying swagger. As he does, he nearly bumps into the mound of muscle that cleans his armpits, who still has his back towards us. Reynolds looks up, as though he's seen the reincarnation of the Colossus of Rhodes. He gulps like a child, seeing his idol. He doesn't stop either. It's like he's starstruck. What are you doing? Says Joshua, laughing. You've got the hots for him, Reynolds. Reynolds snaps out of it, and in a panic he jumps beneath the shower beside the mystery man, flicking the metal and releasing the water. As we laugh at Reynolds, his partner in crime enters through the mist. It's Stimps. Stimps is so thin, he almost has to push himself through the mist. His face is long like a horse with those same simple black eyes that seem to blink on their own individual accord. His limbs are thin and his joints are bulbous and all knobby. He's the number two of the comedy act, and if he sat on Reynolds' knee, he could pass as his ventriloquist dummy. Where's Ren? he asks, with one of those slow blinks whilst wiping the mist from his eyes. I point towards the other side of the room, and Stimp's head slowly turns, like his mind. But he looks straight past his pal, and then gawps at the new guy. The mystery muscle man looks down at Stimps, gritting his teeth. His top lip curls up in a condescending eyes glare down. Stimps' expression is the opposite, soft and gormless. I can't tell if it's because of the impressive physique before him, or if it's just his natural expression. The big man lathers his chest with shower gel, a red one. It's nearly the same colour as his face. The gel turns to white, and he continues to stare at Stimps, just simply stares back. Then the Colossus stops washing and a small intensity begins to grow. Stimps is almost too stupid to realise what is happening. But then he lowers his head, removes his gaze and like a lesser dog he walks around the huge guy towards his friend Ren. I watch the big man's eyes never leave Stimps. Not until Stimps puts his own shower on. I watch him let out a dirty smile as he continues to wash those amazing biceps. Say Dan, shouts Reynolds across the room. What were you benching today? He says loud and clear, so everyone can hear. I know his game immediately. About 150. Why? I say, knowing exactly why he's asking. No reason, he says, shrugging his shoulders and squeezing soap between his hands and his fat armpits. Isn't that some kind of record round here? He says. His question is hollow and stupid. It's true. Here at work, I'm known as the strong guy, the professional in the gym. I take my protein shakes and eat as much chicken as I can lay my hands on. I work out every morning and can often be seen giving out some tips to the pretenders in the gym. It's the combination of these factors that has led to me being the strongest here, lifting the heaviest. At least I mean at the big three, squat, deadlift, and my personal favourite, the bench press. I've acquired the name as the big presser in our gym. I'm quietly proud of it, but today, my title is in jeopardy. Oh, I'm not sure about any records there, Reynolds. I say, lying quite convincingly. No? Well, I thought I saw a guy come pretty damn close to your record today, he says, 
we all immediately turn to the man with no name. He's facing the wall, then slowly turns down both iron levers, killing the water. Half the steam of the room disappears, along with the noise, unveiling him. I didn't push 150, he says. His voice echoes against the hard wall that he stands too close to. He then turns around, revealing his entirety. His muscles complement each other like poetry. The curves and their symmetry are the melodies of a wonderful arrangement, and it's all barely hidden by a shiny skin. He looks like Mr. Olympia on stage, and if he just pulled out a few poses, he would take the number one spot. He looks around the room through the fading mist, gives us all one good look in the eye, and with a small smile, he leaves the shower room as his heavy wet feet echoing out. Who is he? asks Joshua, who sticks out his bottom lip and shakes his head. He's the new guy, says Reynolds, sticking his podgy face out from the gushing water. You don't say, fat boy, says Joshua, putting Reynolds back into his place, then taking the blue shower gel and squeezing the bottle into Reynolds' face. A huge splurge flies out and collides against Reynolds' eyes. Knock it off, shouts Reynolds, trying to slap away the blue liquid. Joshua laughs and looks at me. I shoot him a smile and tell him to give over, then flick the metal lever to my side, stopping the shower. As the hissing sound subsides, I have a moment of clarity that invites me to think. I think about the arrogant grin of this new guy and his swagger, the way his arms moved, a confidence like he'd showered there a hundred times before. I understood why his arms moved in that way. They are backed up by biceps, huge ones, the body's equivalent of a handgun. Muscles with green veins running down them, like electrical wires charged with pure power. We had all been watching him from the corner of our eyes. That bothered me. The arrogant way he had somehow dominated that time and space, as if we were the new guys. I barely understand how he had done this, but he had, and now I felt ashamed. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe what bothered me the most was that he might be able to bench more than me. He could be stronger than me. The four of us regulars step out the shower room into the cooler air of the locker room. Me and Joshua lead the way and get changed. At the other end is the new guy applying the final touches to his uniform, navy blue trousers and jacket, with a white shirt underneath. He straightens up his dark blue tie and fastens his jacket. Then he puts on a small blue rigid cap we wear with a black plastic visor on the front, holding the visor and pulling it forward, securing it to his head. He then walks out the exit, the heels of his black shoes echoing all the way. The way he adjusted his tie and walked away, it's like he'd done it a thousand times before. Quite the opposite of my first day here. I remember finding the job online. It sounded fascinating. A corrections officer, it was entitled. I read the job description and couldn't help but be taken in by it. Even though I knew the job descriptions were normally a lot of crap and lies. The sandwich maker is often made out to be some new age artist. It was described as an historical movement in punishment science. The prison of prisons it had been dubbed on TV. So I quickly put in an application. And due to my previous experience as a prison officer and age, just the wrong side of 30, I was a successful applicant. In the interview, they told me there'd be no interaction with the prisoners once they enter. To me, this was perfect. Too much interaction was the reason I wanted to leave the job I was working at at the time. I was a prison officer at Lonsdale. That's the next city down from here. It had been okay, I guess. Except the prisoners had too many freedoms, too many rights. Many were allowed into the city on day trips, for Christ's sake, to get some ice cream or watch a film. Sometimes it went perfectly well. I'd sit there in a cinema, eating my salted popcorn, not able to believe I was being paid for this. But other times, the prisoner would try to make a run for it. It would always end up in a fight, and once I got my nose broke. These fights were quite regular, and it was us guards who paid the price in pain for the do-gooders who wanted a better society. Who would act shocked when one of these evil men escaped and raped their child. I grew tired of being talked to like an animal, being spat at, so I took a job at the cage. We get changed into our uniforms, pulling up our black socks and slipping on our shiny shoes. Once dressed, I walk towards the mirror near the exit and straighten myself up, wiggling my tie and correctly putting on my hat just at the right level. The others talk football. I don't agree with their opinions. 
who's going where in the transfer window and all that, but I don't get involved. Football arguments are stupid arguments in my eyes. The others dress, and with us, all suited and booted, we head across the locker room and head out the door. It's 10 to 7am, and handover is about to begin. We walk down the corridor upon the long navy blue carpet. To our left and right are notice boards, paper with pins in of different colours held up with different A4 pieces of paper that informs us about staff training, meetups, and reports by the regulatory body that calls themselves CW. That stands for Correction Watch, but we all just call it Cage Watch. We pass the papers and head towards the double doors at the end, where the rest of the officers are waiting for handover. We walk into the room. It's big and open with a thin grey carpet and beige walls. Aircon blows over us. It's windowless, except for the one that looks into the warden's office. In the centre is a podium, where the leading officer informs us of the day's nights and events. 2. Bloody Barrett, come on, and the rest of you, says Byron Taylor from the podium. I don't know much about Byron. He's mid-forties and seems to like himself for reasons I can't quite understand. He's tall, with a big gut, but the rest of his body is normal size. His hair is jet black and always stuck down flat to his head, as though he's applied a lot of grease. Right, let's get on with it. Some of us want to go home, he says, ready to deliver his sermon. He looks tired as he takes out a small piece of paper from his pocket and coughs to clear his throat. <clears throat> right, here we go. Cage 1, nothing to report. Cage 2, nothing to report. 3, nothing to report. Right, 4, he says, looking at the ceiling towards a grey metal aircon box. Yeah, something's not right in 4 and I don't really know what it is, says Byron, looking perplexed. When you go by, take a look. Things are different in there. Nothing to worry about, I'm sure, but... He says, continuing down the list. Okay, five, fine, six, fine. Seven needs a light replacing. So if one of you could get on that today, then yeah. The other cages are fine too, he says, ruffling the piece of paper and shoving it back into his pocket. We then hear to our right the warden's office door open. Instinctively, we all look. Whenever we hear that door, our stomachs sink, expecting a tongue lashing from something that went wrong the previous day, because we don't normally see the warden until about 10am after he's had several strong coffees. But it isn't him coming out the door. It's the new guy. From the podium, I hear Byron let out a sigh and then check his watch. So I guess it's your first day, says Byron, with the red-faced giant nods. Right, come over then. What's your name, big lad? Says Byron, stepping off the podium, itching to leave. Cage Shaw, he says, joining the rest of us, making us feel a bit smaller. You done this kind of work before? Says Byron putting his hand in his pockets and sizing him up. Do I have needed to? Says Kay with as much confidence. No, no. <laughs> I was just wondering. It helps. Anyway, you lads introduce yourself and help him out. Says Byron, looking across at all of us. Anyway, I'm sure a big lad like you can handle yourself. Says Byron, walking through as we step aside for him. But as he walks towards Cade, he doesn't move. He just stands there and Byron gets uncomfortably close. Then Cade looks down at him with a sneer. Watch my shoes, he says seriously, then smiles. Byron smiles back, but it's obvious he doesn't find it funny. As Byron walks away, he scratches his head, wondering what just happened. Then Reynolds steps up to Cade and speaks with his usual false confidence. All right, name's Reynolds, but everyone calls me Ren. If you want to come with me, I can show you around, he says. For some reason, I expect Cade to laugh at him whose head's at the big man's belly button. But he doesn't. Maybe he appreciates the bullshitter's confidence as he nods at Wren. Reynolds turns to the rest of us and says, Well, that's as long as you guys don't have a problem with it. Joshua responds, It's all yours, Wren. I watch them walk away, and it's comical, little and large. Because of how fat Wren is, some might dispute that description. They open the door to outside, to work, and the natural morning light creeps into the handover room. I slowly follow, out into the open, into the killing fields. That name, killing fields, it's always struck me as strange. It's appropriate, but it's almost poetic. It romanticises this god-awful place, something it doesn't deserve. I guess the scene in front of me is kind of awe-inspiring, at least structurally. I'm out in the open air, the morning sky is above me, and in front, 
I can see a hundred miles of nothing but horizon. To either side of me are what we call the cages. They're complete glass. Each one measures about 150 square metres. It takes about four minutes to walk around the outside of the cage. They're in a perfect row, with five on my left and five on my right, and in the centre is a tarmac road about 20 feet wide. We call it the corridor, and it's upon this corridor we guards spend our days, watching the cages, watching hell. 3. I take some slow steps down the centre. My work shoes sound heavy on the smooth tarmac. As I walk forward, all the glass cages come into view. Each is illuminated inside by huge floodlights that are never turned off. The famous saying goes, the lights are always on in the world's darkest place. At the end of the tarmac corridor, beyond cage 9 and 10, there is a parking bay or a pickup bay, whichever you want to call it. Here the new prisoners arrive and even sometimes the ones who have served their time leave. They arrive and leave in a large black bus that reminds me of a limousine on steroids. I stand in the corridor and look at the hazy blue morning sky and wonder what awaits. The air still has that morning coolness and I suddenly think I need a coffee. I shout out to Joshua who stands outside cage one, talking to another guard. He gives me a wave without really listening and I head back into the main building, through the corridor, past the gym and towards the canteen. I stand in there and to my right is the cash register. It was once a fully functioning calf with a couple of chefs who would serve us meals throughout the day. But all that has stopped due to cutbacks. Now it's essentially a big staff room that people barely enter, only to grab a coffee or a tea. I walk past the till to where a small black coffee machine stands. I put a plastic cup beneath it and press Americano. I smell the fresh aroma of the coffee and embrace it, then wonder about taking Joshua one, but I decide against it. I could probably sit there in the canteen table and do nothing for about an hour and get away with it, but I decide against it. It's best to be with the others. I head back into the morning air, sipping on my bitter coffee. I can see Joshua and a guy called Rick halfway down the tarmac, pointing into cage four with an intrigue. I then remember what Byron had said about it in handover. I walk up to them, taking another sip. As I approach, they look through the crystal clear glass towards the far right corner. What are you looking at? I ask. What do you think's going on over there? says Rick, a short bald guy with a goatee beard. I look into the corner and it's bizarre. In the distance, men stand there with their chests puffed out, as if they're guarding something. What are they doing? says Joshua, with a hint of annoyance. Humans have never liked difference. It looks like they're protecting something, says Rick, rubbing his goatee beard with deep in thought. We stand there looking at it, past the chaos past all the weak bodies and the bloody prisoners who lay about, succumbing to death. We look past all the fighting and horror to the far corner, where they stand in harmony, almost as one. I don't like that. I think we need to tell the warden, says Joshua. Yeah, he probably already is aware, but I'll go let him know, I say, taking a gulp of my coffee that's already cooling down to that perfect temperature, turning and heading back down the tarmac. As I walk down, I look into the other cages with a little more intrigue, the contrast I have just witnessed reveals a true awfulness my mind has become numb to. Through the clear glass, I see men of all creed, black and white, and everything in between. I can see some crawling on their knees while screaming. Others just stand there and cry. Some are wearing the issue orange jumpsuits they enter with, but many are naked, revealing rib cages that remind me of skin just draped over small trees. Some are even curled up into the fetal position, the way they are born waiting to die that way too. Between these men is the blood-stained floors with the occasional teeth. Often fights break out, issues of dominance and fear. A few times I've seen a victor rape the man they've just beaten and even eat part of his victim once. I've seen all humanity within these glass walls. It's all so evil. I don't understand it. I once watched men gather so randomly, almost like birds in a flock, and they stamped some loner to death until all that was left was clothes on the floor. I have seen a man beaten and raped, and when the ordeal finished, a queue kind of formed to take turns upon this poor soul. But what's really strange is as you watch this, you can't hear the screams through the thick glass. It's all seen in a disturbing silence. 
This is the cage. This is their punishment. It's themselves. To express upon each other their own evil. And we can do nothing but watch. I continue my walk into the main building and enter the handover room, breathing in the air-conditioned air, cold into my lungs. I walk past the briefing podium and stand outside the warden's door. I read the word, warden, in gold, in the centre of the door. I wrap my knuckles against the wood, just below the writing. Enter, says the warden, not sounding too happy. He never does. I just hope he's had at least three coffees. 4. The warden's office has a very different feel to the briefing room. The carpet is brown and the room feels warmer for it. The warden sits behind a big oak desk. There is a bookshelf in there in the far corner. People rarely read books these days. Everything is online. But it gives the room a feel of intelligence the warden likes to display. Behind him in his desk is a draconia plant. Above it is two pictures in gold frames. In the picture to the left, he has stood on the beach in his best suit, with his arm around his wife. She's wearing a silk blue ankle length dress. In front of them, standing just as proud as a Dobenham, they all stare down at the camera, not one of them smiling. The picture to the right shows him in a karate outfit wearing a black belt, with an old Asian man standing behind him. They are both in a fighting stance, and both are smiling. What can I do for you, Barrett? says the warden behind his desk, typing some last words upon his laptop. His name is Hank Bloggs. He's been the warden here since the place opened five years ago, and he isn't going anywhere soon. He has a grey face with a light blue eyes, almost grey. His grey hair is thin and pokes out from under his hat. His stern face looks upon me. I just came in to make you aware of some peculiarities in Cage 4, I say. What is it? He says sharply. Well, you see, the top corner, they, they don't seem to be doing much. So the problem is they're not fighting each other. Kind of, but doesn't sound like a problem to me, Barrett, says the warden looking back at his laptop and moving the cursor. Well, I guess I could say it's, it looks like they're guarding something. Hmm, that is strange. Well, if that's true, that will take some investigation. Are you sure they're guarding something? Says the warden, looking up at me. I think so. A lot of men have stood there in a kind of line, protecting something in the far back corner. I can't say for certain, but I definitely think it's worth a report. Okay, right. I'll make a note of it and send it to CW. I'm sure they'll come back with some advice. Personally, I think it's probably another level of sickness we can't comprehend. As we know, there's no law in the cage, so whatever they're doing, it's legal. I know, sir. Just thought it was worth a quick mention. Yeah, yeah, you've done the right thing, Barrett. You know what? Take a seat, we'll have a quick chat. I walk further into the office and take a seat on the dreaded chair in front of his desk. Dan, I don't know you that well, says the warden calling me by my first name, trying to break down the formality. No, not too well, sir, no. Call me Ank, he says, closing his laptop and leaning forward. Be honest with me, do you like your job? He asks. I think for a moment, and I don't want to be too honest. It's okay, I guess. I I'm not in love with it, but, you know, I like to do my bit and I like my wages each month. You understand? I say. Of course. I'm not going to sit here and tell you how you should feel. I get guys coming here telling me they just love it, just because I'm their boss. Well, let's be honest, how could you? I mean, you guys have to stand out there, each morning and night, watch the most devastating aspects of humanity for hours on end. you got a front row seat to hell, says the warden. I'm surprised by his honesty, almost impressed with his genuineness. Can I ask you a sensitive question, Dan? He says, looking up at me with his grey face. When did the nightmares stop? The truth is they hadn't. Often I fell asleep with the eyes of the teenage boy staring at me, pleading for me to do something. In my nightmares, I can always hear my heavy shoes walking away, down the tarmac, but never the screams. My shoes go click, clock, click, clock, and I shut the door, shutting the killing fields out. The door creaks, but it's no normal creak. It's a human screaming. And as the door shuts, everything turns black. I usually wake up at this point, my heart pounding and the sheets drenched. Only once did I keep dreaming after that point. I kept walking into the cafeteria and put my plastic cup under the coffee machine. And as I pressed the button for an Americano, 
blood poured out, filling my cup and falling onto the cafeteria floor. They stopped some time ago, sir. Beer helps me sleep, I say. Ha! Man's best friend. I'll be honest. Took me years to get rid of them. I think if I had to stay out there on the killing fields, watching that blood spill, that kind of evil, they would come back, says the warden, staring hazily at his desk. It's part of the reason I've asked you to take a seat, he says, looking back up at me, putting the nightmares behind him. I've been advised by CW to employ another senior, like Byron. I need my best man, and I'll be conducting interviews. Personally, I think you'd be a great candidate, he says. Oh, I don't know about that. I don't think my heart's in it, I say. Well, it's less time out there and more time in here. You would write a few reports on the upkeep, daily report on each cage. It isn't hard. You're more than capable, Dan, says the warden, flicking back open his laptop. It's true. It would be a better job. Less time out there would be nice, especially in the winter. I'll think about it, I say, mustering a smile. Good lad, and when you leave, shut my door. It really pisses me off when people don't, says the warden dismissing me. Five. I head out the warden's office and towards the killing fields. The sun is rising, it's brighter now and the sky is bluer. The cool morning air has been replaced by a neutral still feel. Up ahead, I can see the majority of the guards in pairs walking up and down the corridor chattering away with the occasional glance into the cages, but mostly are trying to pretend they don't exist. There are only two leavers this morning, inmates at the end of their sentence. We do the first one from cage two. The usual protocol is taken. Me, Joshua, Rick and Stimps head towards the cage door. It's two thick panels of glass attached to the cage, like an automatic shop door. Me and Stim stand closest to the door, beside the electronic screen built into the glass that controls the door with a microphone on it. I press the touchscreen and dim the lights in the cage, and all the prisoners begin to sit down. I speak into the microphone, and my voice booms through a large speaker at the top of the cage. Inmate Miller, 2752, approach the cage door immediately. All other inmates are to remain seated. Failure to do so will result in execution. I say, knowing the script off by heart. We wait for the prisoner to come to the door. I look at Joshua and Rick who stand behind me, pointing their heavy metal rifles towards the door. Old habits die hard. I look at the screen as Miller stands before the door. The camera inside shows me a dark-skinned man with a small scar below his left eye. He looks Hispanic. The screen then turns green, meaning we have a right match. That's our man, says Rick, looking a little tense. Right, ready boys, I say, getting ready to press the open button. Rick and Joshua align themselves a little better, and Stimps gets the handcuffs ready and gives me a nod. Let's do it, says Joshua. I press the button and the glass door slides open. From the dark cage, a man steps out slowly. He watches us, taking us in with big startled eyes. I can see his face is drawn and his cheeks are pulled in. I can see his teeth through them. Inmate Miller, I shout. Your time at the correction centre is over. Prepare to be arrested. I don't need to finish my speech. He drops to his knees and puts his hand behind his head and begins to cry. Stimps move forward and puts the cuffs on the prisoner and Rick and Joshua lower their guns. As I watch him cry, Stimps pulls him up and I try to put away my natural sympathy. Miller is probably a murderer, I have to remind myself. Why are you crying, boy? Says Joshua, stepping forward, looking the criminal in the eye. Miller looks up with big brown eyes, and his white teeth slowly reveal themselves. You don't understand, says Miller in a foreign accent I can't quite put my finger on. I am not upset. I am happy. <laughs> Get him out of here, I say to Stimps, who shoves him down the tarmac corridor. The sun shines upon the pair, turning them into silhouettes as they walk towards the pickup bay. I imagine Miller is feeling... He's reaching heaven as the sun rises ahead of him. Miller the killer, says Rick, spitting on the ground beside me. They make me sick, says Joshua. I say nothing. I watch them disappear and wonder how long it is till home time. The rest of the day passes without problem. 
We see to the second lever, and Reynolds tells me that he and Cade will see to the faulty light. I don't really understand, but apparently he got it covered. Personally, I would have just called out maintenance. I hope that's his plan. But I know Reynolds well, trying to show some authority in front of the new guy. I don't care. I nod and smile. If I come in tomorrow and hear Reynolds has dropped from the ceiling and landed in the cage, I will probably laugh. It gets to 2pm and it's home time. I leave the killing fields, walk into the main building towards the changing rooms. I lock up my uniform and change with a surprising speed. As I leave, the rest of my team comes through the changing room doors. Catch you tomorrow, says Joshua. I give him a smile and a pat on the back, then I'm down the blue carpeted corridor and out the front of the main building, into the city streets. The building is situated right on the edge of town. It doesn't look impressive from the outside. Simple steps lead to double glass doors. But it doesn't need to be impressive, as there's no guests, the prisoners arrive round the back, and all the important decisions are made at the office, at the police station in the town centre. Across the road is a car park. It's surrounded by young trees in a perfect square, and my chrome blue 20 Porsche sits there. She's my pride and joy, and certainly the greatest car I'll ever own. I always look forward to the drive home. 6. I switch on the engine by pressing the button on top of the handbrake and the engine purrs. I never have liked auto drive. I like the control. I guess I'm a bit of an old timer that way. I release the handbrake and pull out between two oak trees that are the pillars of the car park entrance. I turn right, drive past my workplace, reading the letters above the door ingrained in the concrete. MSCC. It stands for Maximum Security Correction Centre, but nobody ever calls it that. It's always the cage. I drive out of town and the streets are clean. Traffic's down and the air feels fresh. It wasn't like this a decade ago. The homeless and hookers lined the roadside and the air was thick with pollution. It's true, crime plummeted when the cage opened. I guess it's all down to fear. The quickest way, the easiest route to get society to change. Once they knew of a place that truly was evil, and they could truly get there, people began to play by the book. They went to work and paid their taxes, they lived their lives, and it was evident in the air. People always argue about the ethics, but they won't argue about the results. People can feel benefits. The cage reduces crime and corruption. It does work. I continue my drive out the city, past some small woodland into the countryside, I look to my left and see acres of green grass dotted with a sheep, looking like grounded clouds in the distance. It's the same either side, with the sun setting in the west. On my drive, beyond one of the fields is a magnificent mansion. I can't see all the details, as only parts are revealed through oak trees. I sit back and wonder what it would be like to live there. I do this often on drives home from work, imagining life on the other side of the oak trees. I then reach for the car stereo pressing play on Dan's playlist. From the speakers, Castles Made of Sand by Jimi Hendrix begins to play. The guitar takes me away, far away from the worries of work, and I began to think of that cold beer hitting my lips when I reach home. Seven. I turn into my driveway beside the house, hearing the crackle of stones beneath the slowing tyres. I turn off the engine and open the car door, and the black metal gate is in front of me. Ahead of me is a large concrete opening and my garage. Beside it is my garden. My garden descends almost all the way back to a riverbank, about a hundred feet away. It's surrounded by roses and flowers that are beautiful in bloom. The green grass is lush, and at the end of the garden... I see my wife sitting in a deck chair. 
I walk towards her. Her name's Chloe, and I feel nervous. I always do now when approaching the woman I'm supposed to love. She must see me coming, but she doesn't bother to look up. Her black hair hangs in front of her face as she stares at the screen on her thighs. Hey, honey, I say with as much confidence as I can muster, but nothing. She just stares down and swirls the red wine in her hand. I see a small movement, a smile almost, which turns into a giggle, but it's not for me. She's reading something funny on Facebook or some other media platform, amused by somebody, anybody but me. I sigh and prepare to turn back down the garden when... My sister's coming in ten minutes, she says in her beautiful husky voice. I love her voice. I yearn for more interaction. I hope she will look up at me with those big beautiful eyes I fell in love with. But no, they remain on the screen. I head back down the garden towards the house. It's a bungalow. I open the white, triple glazed door and enter my house. Immediately, I'm in the kitchen. It's modern, granite grey coloured worktops. I finished fitting it last summer. I thought it would never end. On one side is the white kitchen table with a fruit bowl with only apples. I pass through into the living room and the cool air is delightful. Light shines in through a far window and shimmers against a wooden floor. I look left at the luminous blue light of the fish tank on my side. It's a big tank, six foot and I watch a catfish with jaguar-like markings release its sucking grip from the side of the tank and move to another popular part of the aquarium. I lean in closer and watch the wonderful array of colours on the gubby fish swimming and smile. In ways, there's more life in this tank than there is in the rest of the house. After a shower, I get changed into a blue shirt. I don't really like it. My wife bought it for me, back when she liked me. I slip it on, her desired version of me. As I look in the mirror, I can't tell if I look older or younger for it. One thing I do look is tired and depressed. Perhaps it's the blue. I walk back into the garden and hear laughter amongst the birdsong. I'm transpired and smile, but it soon becomes apparent I'm not welcome. What's his name? I hear Sandra say, Chloe's sister, with a toothy smile on her horsey face. Sandra is two years older than her sister and is a good-looking woman like my wife, but her features are a little more prominent, thick eyebrows and teeth with a face on it. Hey Sandra, I say in a happy family kind of way, showing my teeth that aren't no match for hers. <laughs> hey Dan, she says so effortlessly. I wish she hadn't wasted her breath. Over red wine, four identical blue eyes watch me in my blue shirt. I watch my wife pass her tablet to her uglier sister. She looks down at the screen, and those white warriors are again unleashed. Nice, says Sandra with a coy look. You know Dan... Why don't you go take a walk by the river, says my wife, looking towards me, then at the end of the garden. Her delicate features, bright eyes, and thick hair blowing gently in the wind. If she wasn't so beautiful, she'd seem less like a bitch. Okay, darling, I say with a prize-winning smile. Happy families. I go walk the riverbank. Eight. I walk the riverbank and look over the thick grass towards the river. It's a brown colour same as the power plant's cooling towers that are in a distance that give birth to man-made clouds. I stand on the raised bank and allow the cooler, fresher air coming off the water to breeze over my face. I breathe in the country air and watch a barn owl fly over gracefully above the water. Behind me, I can hear the cackles of the sisters. I cringe as their laughs act like sticks against my ribs for some reason I can't explain. I walk a little further to get away from their awful influence on the surroundings. I come to an oak tree and sit below it, watching the setting sun that turns yellow to orange as it moves towards the horizon. As I sit below the oak, I gravitate towards deeper thought, towards Chloe. I know she no longer loves me. She can barely make eye contact with me, never mind other types of contact. Not that I even really want sex with her anymore. I yearn for more understanding, a conversation. I want to see them lips move more towards a smile as she looks at me then feel them as she moves towards me. I play devil's advocate in my mind, and I imagine her with another man. Perhaps I'm at work. I can see her face. Her joy of feeling him, while their faces and bodies laugh at me. This thought's plagued me a lot. My wife's thoughts, what she thinks, what she really wants. How ignorant I'm actually being. The real misery is I'm now more content at work where the blood and the hair of men lay on concrete ground. How do I feel better there? 
There I'm less anxious, less paranoid. Sitting in a room with my wife is worse than being alone. Because when you're alone, nobody can laugh at you. So I sit watching the sun setting for 45 minutes. As I walk back, I can hear the cackles coming from the garden. They will be drunk now, and they won't ignore me, because I want to be ignored. As I enter the garden, they both stop what they're doing. Jesus Christ, says my wife to her sister as she gulps her wine. The wine I paid for. I almost laugh back at them, the absurdity, but no, I put down my head and walk past. My wife doesn't take kindly to this. She wants to see me hurt. That it, she says in a husky voice that slurs now. Excuse me, I say, widening my eyes and looking up. She doesn't like it. I see her scowl as I do nothing. She then notices her reflection. She sees a bitch staring back. Bedtime, is it done? She says, drinking more wine. I don't look back down, and I continue to the house as I hear them laughing again. The fish need feeding. He looks into his victim's eyes. A fragile man who's just been brought in. He sits on the floor while he watches. He has found what he wanted. To him, the screams are barely audible as he licks his lips. Take off your clothes, he whispers, sliding a dirty finger behind his ear, moving the greasy hair from his eyes. His victim lowers his eyes to the ground, knowing all too well what's about to happen, but not daring to look at unspeakable evil in the eye. Hi. Says the victim. He kneels beside him and puts his long fingers gently on the back of his head. It wasn't a question, he says, feeling him shake as he closes his eyes and cries. Nine. I look at the barbell inches from my face. It shines, and I see my bulging eyes and gritting teeth. Come on, damn, says Joshua behind me, with his growing inches from my face as he spots me. I look into the reflection of my eyes. This weight won't defeat me. My chest hurts, my hands are sweating, and I can feel I'm losing it. Come on, I shout out into the gym, as a small bit of spit hits my lip. The bar begins to move, rising so slightly. I exhale, and I push, and my arms lock out, with the weight successfully above my chest. Good lad, Dan, says Joshua, taking the barbell and fixing it back safely on the frame. I pull myself up and feel light. Joshua slaps me on the back, and the world regains weight as he passes my bottled water. Still panting, I regain my senses, and hear his voice behind me. Calm down. I was just wondering, can you get your head any further up his arse? We both turn and see the new guy, Cade. He smiles with little teeth and with his chest that was born to bench. He wears a sickly green tiny vest top. I say it's tiny, but in truth it's just dwarfed by his huge shoulders and swollen chest. Behind him, Reynolds and Stimp stand close enough to suggest they're jimming with him now, but not too close to suggest they're friends yet. Joshua, you faggot, says Reynolds, looking like a ten-year-old in the playground, weasel next to his bully pal. Reynolds laughs but alone. His embarrassment is only saved by a small smile from Cade. Piss off, Reynolds, says Joshua in a heartbeat. This does get people's attention, as everyone in earshot begins to laugh, including me. What were you lifting, Parrot? says Cade, happily taking control and centre of the gym. I can't believe it's his second day at work. Er, I say, looking back at the barbell. 260 kg, that, says Joshua like he's my official trainer, flinging a towel over his shoulder. It reminds me of a mechanic talking about his car he's trying to sell. Nice, says Cade, blowing air from his lips in an expression that almost looks genuine. Yeah, it is nice, says Joshua, narrowing his hazel eyes, trying to decipher the sarcasm. Yeah, it is, says Cade, narrowing his blue eyes, 
even trying to decipher the threat. Kay turns to look at me. His face is smiling, but I see a crazed fire in those blue eyes. You can lift more, right? His eyes are so intense, I feel compelled to look away. He looks like a man from the cage. Um, I don't know. To be honest, I mean... <laughs> what? Are you saying you can lift that shawl? Says Joshua, glaring. Kay looks at Joshua, and the crazed fire in them blue eyes roars. I don't think you're as strong as you look, Shaw, to be honest, says Joshua, throwing petrol on the fire. I notice Cade is shaking a little. Move, Barrett, says Cade, but with eyes firmly on Joshua. His tone annoys me, so arrogant. I feel the others looking at me. I can't let it go. Move what? His chaotic eyes return to mine. He's shaking. Don't let me embarrass you twice today, he says. He might be able to outlift me. He's a big guy, but it's a big weight, and the idea of him dropping it on himself calms me. I move aside, and the big man straddles the bench. He slips himself beneath the barbell and wraps his thick fingers around the metal. You going to spot me? Says Kate to Joshua, staring at the shiny metal barbell and presumably his red reflection. I wonder what colour this guy's going to go under the immense pressure. Perhaps he'll just pop. Why, you're not confident? Says Joshua. Oh, whatever, says Cade. He breathes outwards and the weight is up. He balances it above his head, 260 kg. He grits his teeth and lets gravity do the easy bit. The bar comes down and touches his chest. He takes two breaths, pauses and then begins to move. He heaves. His wrists shake, a metal plate wobbles, but the metal does go up. His elbows then lock out, and it's back on the frame in no time. He sits up the same colour. I'm surprised he made it look that easy. Without a word, he gets up and moves around the bench. He takes two 2kg plates and slides them on each side of the barbell. Might as well have a proper workout while I'm here, says Cade, smiling, then putting himself beneath the barbell. Every guard in the gym gathers around, and I stare in disbelief. I'm about to watch my reputation fade into memory. Beneath the iron bar, Cade's face has been washed of all emotion. All that remains is a machine. Hey Cade, you want me to spot you for this one? Says Reynolds, waddling over. Whatever, says Cade, glaring at the iron that's part enemy, part friend. He must appreciate it, yet hate it all at once. Do you think he can lift it? whispers Joshua beside me. You've changed your tune, I say, watching the weight go up. Well, we're about to find out. As Cade lifts it off the frame, a big gush of air is released from his lips. He drops the weight quite quickly, just in control. The bar's on his chest, and he pushes it. Two deep breaths later, it's an inch up. He pauses. His wrist shake, and his right leg extends as his face screws up. Come on, Cade, push, you've got this, shouts Reynolds behind him. Come on, then, bellows Cade Shaw like a madman. Push it, shouts Reynolds, kneeling down, placing his hands beneath the bar just in case it drops, though I'm not sure the fat man could lift it if he did. I can see Cade's face beginning to hurt. His face is close to purple as he shakes from his temples, but his hands rise, slowly but surely, the bar moves up. That's it, you got it, says Reynolds, as the bar passes his face. It's up! Cade's face turns to a more usual colour. Just its nice, normal, heart attack red, rather than brain tumour purple. He pulls back the bar, and it lands on the metal frame with a clout. Woo! Says Cade, sitting up, gathering his senses. I have to admit, his pecs look huge. I barely believe what I've just seen, as a ripple of applause breaks out for the new big guy. Is that a gym record? Says Stimps from behind the bench. Cade looks at Reynolds with big eyes and a coy smile. And Reynolds looks at me. There's only one person who can be sure of that, says Reynolds. Every eye in the gym is on me. Yeah, it is, I say, feeling like I'm putting my masculinity in a box with a ribbon on it and giving it to Cade. Cade stands up and does a couple of muscle man poses while laughing. Don't be disheartened, Barrett. Think you can lift it? Be my guest, says Cade, squirting water into his mouth from his sports bottle. 
Of course he can lift it, says Joshua, moving to the bench. Come on, Dan. I look into Joshua's hazel eyes that don't have anything to lose. As I look at the bench, I can see an electric chair. I know I can't handle it. I don't think so, Josh, I say, envisioning my balls now in that gift wrap present to Cade. He smiles with those annoying teeth, and he walks towards me and puts his arm on my shoulder. No worries, little guy, he says with a laugh while walking away. There is no thought process. I march up to the bench and get beneath the bar. I know I can't lift it, but little man, I don't care. I'll go down with a fight. My hands wrap around the metal bar, and Joshua gives me a, Come on, Dan. I see my peripheral, Cade and everyone else taking a step closer. I try to push the weight from the frame, but it barely moves, and I feel like gravity has been turned up. I exhale, heavily, and worry about this monster about to move. What am I doing? I ask myself, as I know if I lower this weight, it's not getting back up. Not a chance judging on his last one, says Cade, echoing my thoughts. But I lower the weight. It feels like a car, but I push with all my might. It's just me in the bar. Joshua lowers himself and puts his lips next to my ear. You got this. No. That wasn't a question, Dan. Come on, lift. I give it everything. My triceps, biceps, pecs, and even my back. Forcing with all my might, but nothing. The barbell is a permanent fixture, and I'm an intruder. Come on, Dan. I drop the weight, and the bar burrows into my chest. I feel my ribs sinking. Shit, says Joshua, putting his hands under the bar and his crotch in my face. But the barbell still sinks. Adrenaline fades. Pain rises as I struggle to breathe. Help me then, shouts Joshua at those who stand and stare. My vision blurs as my lungs begin to burn. Lift, says Joshua. His voice is now soft and distant as I'm going under. The last thing I feel is the barbell as I go unconscious. Life is thrown back into me in the form of water crashing against my face. I'm back in the gym, but something's wrong. Only Stimps is looking at me. You okay? He asks. I don't reply. I look across at elevated voices. It's the warden. You with us now, Barrett? He says, pointing a big finger at me. Yes, sir, I say in a weak voice. Got bored of embarrassing yourself, did you? Yes, sir, my voice is finding itself. I saw all of that. We don't need any of this crap. Lifting that weight is unsafe. That goes for all of you, not just Cade, all of you who thought that was impressive. Do you understand? I'm looking at you, Joshua, says the warden. Yes, sir, it's just that. Don't bother, says the warden. Yes, sir, says Joshua. Right, Barrett, sure, get showered and uniforms on. Then hand over, then my office. Do you understand? Yes, sir, I say, as Kay just smiles. The warden leaves the room and takes his authority with him. There's a void, and Cade steps into it, laughing. Ha <laughs> ha, I didn't expect that. Thought you were going to die there for a second, he says. His laughter is contagious, and the others laugh and return to their machines. Joshua shrugs. As I stand up, my knees feel weak. Joshua steps in and puts his arm on my shoulder. You okay? He says. Nah, not really, I reply. Man, phew, you'd have been in real trouble there if Kate hadn't come and taken that weight off you. <laughs>